morning again. Good to see you guys. Uh, I am, I'm many things. A party planner is not one of them. Anybody good at planning? Just stick your hand up, just so we know. Okay, I see, I see that hand. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. Uh, my wife, who's, who's still out of town, she's in Trinidad um, for a funeral that last week. My wife, Lori, in fact, is a party planner. She can whip up a party for a thousand people in like, you know, zero to 60 seconds. She can just, she rattles it off. So I get really nervous when it's my responsibility to plan a party for her. This gets really hectic. This gets a little crazy, right? You know, I'm not a planner. She is a planner. So she has very high expectations and I need to plan a party for her. Uh, It usually doesn't work out too well. A couple years ago, we uh, did a, a birthday party for her at her, her favorite restaurant, her favorite Italian restaurant, Buca di Beppo. Anybody ever been there? We got a couple of them around the country. They, they got one in White Marsh now, which is, which is really cool. And so party of like, you know, 400 people, or I, I don't know, it felt like 400 people. It was probably like 30. But anyway, it felt like 400. I'm freaking out. You know, I want to make sure everybody's got their stuff. And I just don't do well in that environment where I feel, you know, responsible for everybody's refill. You know, I don't know, like... It just kind of does something to me. So I'm freaking out. Hope everybody's having a good time. Hope everybody's enjoying themselves, you know, and, and Lori feels celebrated. And so I got a lot of stuff going on. But I also have this thing going on. I used to work at a restaurant. So I, I'm kind of freaking out because I want make, I want to make sure everybody's taking care of the server. Anybody, any restaurant workers in the house? Anybody know that, that struggle, right? You got a huge group of people, and we're obviously, most of us are church people, which I, I hate to say this, uh, we don't have a good reputation in the restaurant world. I just want to say that. Because instead of leaving tips, we leave a track that says, you're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. And that doesn't go over, <laughs> it doesn't go over too well. So this guy who's serving the whole room, I mean, this guy's killing it. He's breaking his sweat, getting refills. He's like, root beer, sweet tea, water, I got you. Appetizer, right here. Like, he's slinging stuff out. This guy, is he's on top of it. And so we get to the end, and the bills go out. And, and so I'm nervous because I want to make sure everybody takes care of him, and I feel obligated to over-tip, you know, because I don't know what everybody else gave. And so I get the bill, and I look down there, and it says, gratuity was included. Have you ever seen that? 18% gratuity included in the bill. So then I, I, take, a, I take a deep breath. I'm like, whew, that's, all right, at least I was taking. Then I feel obligated. Am I supposed to double tip, right? The, you may be thinking, Pastor Chris, you're, you're a little nuts. Like, you're, you're worrying about too much stuff. And I'm thinking, does this guy need to get extra tip now? I don't know what to do here. Like, is he expecting more? I'm like, he's doing a great job. But, you know, he's a great, is he going to come to church? And he's going to come in and say, oh, I know you. You're the guy that didn't double tip. Is that what he's thinking? And then I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, recent years, restaurants had started doing this where parties of, like, six or more, eight or more, they would, they would include the gratuity. And see, a gratuity is a tip for good service, Right? hey, I'm going to give you a tip for, for helping me out. Well, in, in our culture, it's, um, it's become expected, right? 15% is like bottom. That's, it's almost just expected on top of the bill. Uh, and then, you know, if any greater service you add to it. So it's sort of conflicted this idea of a tip or gratuity or a kindness. Now we are guaranteeing them a tip, a gift, a kindness. And a kindness that is an obligation no longer is a kindness or a gift any longer. It turns into a requirement. Once tip is included, in my heart I started to think, this waiter can treat me like garbage because he's going to get his anyway. So he doesn't, so I'm freaking out about something else in this little scenario. I'm like, well, hold on. At any point in the day, he could have just treated us like garbage because he was already going to get 18% over and above what the bill actually was, this guy has the freedom to treat me like trash if he wanted to because he's automatically going to get paid. But never have I actually had a server that had gratuity included treat me like garbage because they, we had a party of six or more. Like they didn't hustle when we had five and a half, and then when we got six, they're like, <laughs> screw you guys, I'm not doing anything else because you're going to pay me anyway. I've never had a server disregard me because their gratuity was already included. It actually had improved their service. Strange, isn't it? When it was guaranteed a gratuity, knowing that it was coming to them, they actually improved their service rather than 
did less. A few weeks ago, we kicked off this brand new series called Anchored, and uh, today we're actually going to be wrapping up this series, uh, and I'll explain a little bit lang- later, but we realized as we were preparing this, this series of, of messages that we as people, as Christians, as believers, just as human beings, we need anchors. We need something to keep us grounded and centered and balanced, and so we, we, we formed this list of anchors that we felt is, is universal to all of us. If we have Christ in our heart, if we've decided to follow him, uh, what anchors will we choose? And we formed this list of five anchors from uh, the great Christian reformer, a guy named Martin Luther. Uh, Luther was a priest. Uh, He felt that the church had drifted from its original purpose, that it it had drifted because it was unanchored. And so in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, 1517, Luther posted his theses of what he felt would anchor the believer as well as anchor the church. And they famously have been boiled down to five, what are called the five solas. And sola is a Latin word for meaning alone or, or only. And so Luther boiled these down and he said, sola fide, which is by faith alone, not by works. We can't earn salvation by doing good things. We can't give enough money to get God on our side. We can't go to church enough. We can't serve enough. We can't be baptized enough. We can't uh, compliment someone enough. We can't let people merge in front of us in traffic enough to get God on our side, although it does make you a good driver and a good person. Uh, Sherika got on me in small group when I said, I don't let people merge all the time. Pray for me. I don't know. It's just a thing. My truck's bigger than that Prius, and I don't have to if I don't want to. All right, maybe we should just stop and just pray for a moment. Anyway, you can't do enough good things to get salvation. So Luther said it's by faith alone. It's by believing that what Jesus did for us is the only way that we can earn salvation is by faith alone. We looked at this on the week one, and we said, hey, people of little faith are okay. If you feel like you don't have enough faith, it's all right, because people of little faith are the ones that God picks. His disciples were people of little faith, and it was okay because that's all they needed when it was placed in the right hands, the hands of Jesus. So Luther said, faith alone is where we need to begin. Sola Scriptura, or Scripture alone. So it wasn't the words of any other person. There was no other human being on the planet that can, we can derive our truth or get our truth from as a foundation, as an anchor. And he said, it's Scripture. This is where we have to begin. We can, we can give our commentary to it. We can explain it the best we can. We can teach on it and preach on it. But it has to be scripture. That has to be the anchor where we, where we stand, where we belong, where we stay. And, and we talked about this in the, in the form of a, biblical, a daily biblical application. And we gave you a resource called SOAP. And I hope you guys have been, have been using it. Don't drop it. Using your SOAP. Anyway, scripture. I'm, I'm, I'm way off the rails right now. Sola, Chris, Sola Christus, he said, uh, is Christ alone. This is the center of our faith. This is the anchor of all anchors. This is Christ alone. It's in him. There's no other person that can do what he did. And this is out of Jesus' own mouth. He declared, I am the way. I'm the gate. I, I'm the door where we walk through. Jesus himself declared, that, that's me. He said, I, I am the way. It's, it's me alone. So this is Jesus, not Luther, who formed this theology. Jesus himself said, it's through Christ alone. And, and Billy preached on that just two weeks ago uh, about Christ being the center. He's the anchor of all anchors. Then Luther said, sola gratia, which is grace alone, which we're going to talk about today. He said, it's by grace alone that we do what we do, that we are able to do. This is God's grace upon us. There's no special human talent or gift or ability in and of ourself. It's only in God's grace that we can do it. And soli deo gloria, for, glor- for God's glory alone. And so these five anchors have what we boil down that we think is going to help us to keep from drifting when, when the winds of life blow. And they will blow. There will be storms that come upon us. You are either in a storm, just coming out of a storm, or about to go into another storm. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. But life is like that. It's what happens. And so to keep us from drifting as the storm comes and the waves push us, we need anchors deep down. And these five anchors are going to help us stay rooted and grounded. Uh, It's going to help us stay where we are. And so I wanted to to pick up with grace, and then we're going to wrap up with glory uh, today also. And the reason being is um, we're going to start a new series next week on the Holy Spirit. 
Um, because in two weeks is something on the calendar. It's called the Day of Pentecost. Now, if you uh, grew up in, a, in an environment that was not uh, Pentecostal, the word Pentecost may actually freak you out because you imagine people with their hands up speaking in tongues and running around or knocking each other over. So you're like, okay, Pentecost equals crazy people. But uh, we're, gonna, we're actually going to show you, the, and we learned actually yesterday, yesterday, the Holy Spirit is not crazy. People are crazy. <laughs> so we're going like, to demystify the Holy Spirit a little bit and talk to you about who he is. And I'm, I'm, this is the one series that I had on the calendar for, since last year. I, I, I knew that I wanted to do this, and um, I, I'm really, really excited about it because I think there's power in the Holy Spirit, and I know it's what Scripture says. And I think we can approach the Holy Spirit not in a fanatical, crazy way, but in an intimate and a pure way and allow him to empower us not to be better than each other, but to be better than ourselves. Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. And I need to be better than me because I'm not that great. You're not that great. We need his power to make us better than we are. And so I'm excited about the Holy Spirit series. So we're going to wrap up Anchor today and kick off Holy Spirit next week. Please, please, please do not miss this next series. It's going to be it's going to be amazing. So, okay, back to our anchors. Grace. Let's start here with the, the fourth anchor of grace. Grace is often confused with its close cousin, mercy. But mercy and grace are not the same thing. Um, they, are, they are closely related, but they are not the same. This is the best way I know how to explain it. Let's say there's a high school student. Uh, his parents have stressed that he, they don't want him to fail any classes. Well, he finds out he's not doing that hot in a class. He gets his report card, and there's an F in macroeconomics. I don't know. He, he flunked some kind of crazy class. He knows it's, it's not good. He knows when he goes home that he's a goner because the standard in his house is, is A's and B's, and, and he, he's failed this class. He doesn't know how. Um, he just knows that he, he's failed it. So he gets home, uh, his parents arrive, parents take a long look, and there's this long silence. And he dies in the silence. So dad calls a family meeting. Hey, let's sit down, let's talk about this. He says, um, son, you got an F in this class. <sighs> We're not going to punish you, Okay. We're not going to punish you. <laughs> All right. This family meeting is awesome. That is what's called mercy. He didn't get what he deserved because he deserved some form of punishment that would, that would help him improve his class. Well, apparently you're paying too much attention to video games or girls or riding your bike or whatever it is that you do. You're paying too much time to that stuff, so we're, we're going we're gonna to remove those things. You're punished from those things so that you can focus on your good grades. That's what he deserved. That is a right punishment for his actions was some type of punishment, but the parent sits down and says, look, we're not going to punish you. That is mercy not getting what you deserve. Instead of not punishing you, we're going to the car dealership and we're going to get you a car. This family meeting is awesome now. That is grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. See, mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Does, does this make sense? Now, the, the, these two come together in this, and let me slow down and, and show you this. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve, and that, that's what we get in forgiveness. God has forgiven us. He, he is, we are sinful people. It, it, it's, it's, we were made this way. You don't have to teach a baby to be selfish. They do it automatically, right? At that year, year and a half mark where they can start grabbing things, a two-year-old, mine, mine, you better back up. You, you see it in the nursery with another baby. They're like, hold on, these are worlds colliding because my parents in my world, they give, you, give me everything that I want and your parents do the same thing. So we got a clash of titans here. We're going to figure out who's going to win and we start tug of war. I mean, it's, it's human beings. It's in us. We are selfish people. We deserve some form of punishment to get us back to perfect. There has to be something to correct what ails us. It's in us. And so God looks down through the cross of Christ because of him and him alone. He says, I'm not going to punish you. 
I'm not going to punish you. Uh, You're actually forgiven. I'm going to give you my mercy rather than my wrath. Because the wrath was poured out on Christ on the cross. He took all of our punishment for us. And you and I are forgiven. We have a clean slate in front of us. But he also gives us grace, not just mercy. He gives us grace. And grace is getting the gift of what we don't deserve. It would be equivalent of our parents buying us a car after we failed a test. Grace is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Grace, uh, in the Greek, is this word charis. Uh, Charis is where we get our word charities. It means joy or pleasure, delight, sweetness, goodwill, loving kindness, favor, gift, uh, it, it means some type of benefit. It, it's a charis, like a, uh, where we give uh, our word charity, voluntarily giving aid or helping, giving assistance, a gift. In Latin, it's this word gratia, uh, which means favor, approval, acceptance, esteem, regard. It's a gift. It's where we get our word gratuity. So when we go to a restaurant and we see gratuity included, it's like, well, I, yeah, that's cool. You gave it to him anyway. I was going to give him more, but if you want to settle for 18, hey, that's fine with me. You know, that's, that's cool. But we get it as a word, a, a tip, a, a gift, a good service. We are going to bless you over and above what we are required uh, because of this word grace. A tip is a grace that you are giving someone. It's unearned, unmerited favor or a gift. Grace is often synonymous in our minds when we read, we believe it's synonymous with forgiveness, but grace is so much more than just forgiveness. And forgiveness is great because I I, I need it in a bad way. You need it in a bad way. But grace is more than just forgiveness. It's so much deeper. It's actually what empowers us to be more than ourselves. It strengthens us. It sustains us. The unmerited side of grace is mercy. The favor side of grace is for a purpose. Grace, a deeper definition that I want us to dig into today, is this. Grace is a divine enablement. Grace is the car that the parents got you. It's a divine enablement for a purpose, a gift for a greater purpose. God has a job for you to do, and it's too big for you. It's too big for me. We cannot do it by ourselves. We we would be crushed under the weight of the punishment of God, so he forgives us mercifully, but God's grace is the gift and the ability to do what he's called us to do, which is bigger than us parents in the failed class. No punishment was mercy. The new car was grace. Why did they get him a new car? So he could get a job. Because apparently you're not going to be a macroeconomics professor, son. So you got to go get yourself a job. Do something with your life. I want to show you a set of verses this morning, and, and it literally blew my mind when I read it the other day. Um, I'd screamed in my office, and I know that I'm a Bible nerd, and you may not scream when you read the verses like I do, but I was like, (laughs) woohoo, yeah. It literally blew my mind, and I I hope that you get even a fraction of that excitement when, when we read it, because it ties these things together so beautifully, like I've never seen before. Because like you, when I read the word grace, I I think it means forgiveness. And there are times in Scripture where it's synonymous with that because it's God's favor. I mean, he's in his favor. He's gifted us with forgiveness and mercy, and it's a beautiful thing. But it's so much deeper when you read it like divine enablement. And I want to show it to you. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 7, and it's about uh, seven or eight verses we're going to read here this morning. Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. We have it on the screens if you didn't bring a a Bible with you. But if you did, hope you got it out in a pen. You're underlining some words because I believe God's going to show us something this morning. Here we go. Paul writing to the Ephesian believers in verse 7 of the fourth chapter. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given. Now, most of us will read that like it says forgiveness. Let's kind of think of it in that terms. But to each of us, forgiveness has been given. Woo, yeah, that's great. But read it as, as a divine enablement. But to each one of us, divine enablement has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, Paul references a, a psalm. He's tying it back to the Old Testament. When he ascended, Jesus ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He's, he's tying this, this charis word because it means gift in the Greek, but to the English, we confuse it because the translation is a little different. Grace is, is such a much of a bigger word than just forgiveness. He gave gifts to his people. Let's jump down to, to verse 11. So Christ himself, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. 
to equip, verse 12, to equip his people for works of service. Now, we gotta, got to slow down in this for a second. So Jesus has given each one of us grace or a divine enablement. And so Paul lists the ways that this divine enablement shows itself among us. Uh, it's, he gave some of us to be apostles. Some of us in this room have a, an apostolic gift. I'll explain that in just a second. Some of us have a prophetic gift or a, a gift to be an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. And it sounds real haughty and, and, and big like it's a title, but I want to show you it's not. It's, just, it's a divine enablement to do something awesome. Verse 12, to equip his people, you guys, us, all of us together, we are all his people, for works of service. So it's not just people who stand on a stage that have a title of as a pastor to do something. It's all of us, the body of Christ. He's given each of us grace, a divine enablement, to equip us for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We cannot, you and I cannot attain the fullness of Christ individually. It has to be in body form. It has to be us doing it together, arm in arm, regardless of we are black, white, yellow, or green, whether we make six figures or we make barely a figure. It doesn't matter where we are on the spectrum, socio and economically, what community we are in, what race we come from, what background, what culture we have. We are the body of Christ, and it's a beautiful mosaic of color, of gender, of, of, of all mixture that you can imagine. We are the body of Christ. Christ. And we cannot attain the fullness of Christ unless we do it together. That's why racism has no place in the body of Christ, in the church. Sadly, across the country, Sunday morning is the most segregated time in the day, the week. We separate according to colors and races and styles and, and, and creeds, all the different pockets. I love the beauty when I look out here and I see different colors of skin and I see different backgrounds and I see different neighborhoods represented. You know, Epic is, is a, has a, a kind of a span, a sprawling reach. We have people coming from Linthicum and White Marsh and Ellicott City and Pasadena. What, what, right? The Dean in the house, right? Essex and Dundalk and Canton and, and, and Fed Hill and people from Locust Point. It's a beautiful thing. It's a mosaic of the city. The body of Christ is a beautiful thing. And we cannot attain the fullness of Christ on our own individually. It would be nice that way, right? Because I can control me. I know how I want me to go. But when I get around people who don't have the same agenda as me and do things differently than me and talk differently than me and look differently than me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, this ain't going to work out. Paul says, no, 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 you attain the fullness of Christ together as a body, the whole measure. I don't know why I got on that, man. I just want to tell you, unity is necessary for us to do what we do. If you have an ought against your brother or sister, go find them today before the service is over. It's way more important than what I'm talking about. You need to settle it and resolve it. Jesus was all about it. Don't come in here with your hands up, singing songs and worshiping and dropping your money in the box. If you hate the guy sitting behind you, deal with it. Unity is important. I don't know, maybe that's for somebody. But let's move on. Let's keep going. Grace. He says, so let's put it all together. Grace, a divine enablement, it's the gift that he's given us so that we can all do these separate things, but coming together as a body, we can reach the fullness of Christ. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants or just kind of infantile and immature in our thinking or tossed back and forth. Listen to the analogy he used. Tossed back and forth by the waves. Woo! We need little anchors, right? Tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind. He's using this boat analogy out there as the winds blow. You just drift along. We need something to anchor us. It's the grace of God. It's the divine enablement that anchors us. We need to be anchored and, and not tossed back and forth by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Paul was not a big fan of people that taught a different gospel than what he was teaching. Verse 15, wrapping it up. He says, instead, we're going to speak the truth, but we're going to speak it in love. We're not going to back away from what scripture says, but we're going to say it in a loving way. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow. Man, Epic has got such a beautiful future ahead of us. God has called us to grow, to reach communities across this city. What you see here is just the beginning. The best days are ahead of us. He's calling us to grow. As we pull together and unify grace upon grace, we're going to grow. I don't know why I'm all fired up this morning, man. This thing is, woo. 
No, no more pre-workout before I preach. It's a three-scoop day. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, I'm back on. I'm back on. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Jesus, the mature body of him who is the head, that's Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Uh, man, this is a lot of stuff. You guys track it with me so far? God's given us gift of grace, and it's not just forgiveness. It's a divine enablement to do a work. And when we all do it together, we become the mature body of Christ. We get to experience the fullness of him. It's not just an individual worship time together. It's when we do it together, all of us, in unity each one of us has been given mercy. We are forgiven because, because of Christ in Christ alone and because of what he did on the cross. Through our faith in his work for us, which we find in the word. We're not only forgiven, but we are given a gift of grace. They, he went and bought us a car, an automobile to do something amazing. And the gift of grace isn't more mercy. It's not more forgiveness. It's to do something. God's gift of grace is a divine enablement to go and to sin no more to go and to be who he called us to be. Nothing keeps me from temptation more than living in my purpose. We think sometimes temptation is a test of our discipline. I, let me just tell you, put it in a different category. Instead of thinking when you are tempted, just don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. God, I need some help. God, I need some help. God, I need some help. Maybe start thinking, okay, God, maybe there's something I should be doing that's in my purpose that I'm not doing. Because i got idle hands right now, and now my thoughts are just going crazy, and I'm thinking about what I can get into and who I can call and who I can text and, and, and some kind of dirt that I can get into because i got idle time. Maybe it's not because you need more discipline. Maybe it's because you need to be doing something in the purpose, God's grace for you. You ever think about that? Nothing keeps me from temptation more than working in my purpose. People don't rock a boat that they're rowing. It's when you pull the oars in and you start looking around for the eagles to fly that you got one idiot in the back that goes, whoa, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Dude, get out of here. People don't rock a boat that they're rowing. If they're going somewhere, if they have a purpose in front of them, man, they're pulling together. They're going a certain direction. They're not worried about rocking the boat and looking out at the sights, man. They're just moving. We have to get in what God has given us, the grace he's given us, the divine enablement. We have to get it into practice, into mode, and start working in our purpose. So then we become the mature body of Christ, moving in the right direction. We get to see the fullness of God when we do it together. The answer to your habitual sin problem might be God's grace, but not forgiveness. Not just him forgiving you, but empowering you to do something greater than yourself. In the purpose class, which is happening today... We give a personality test. It's called the DISC test. Uh, there's four pieces to it, the D personality, the I, the S, and the C. And we're all some combination of those, those four things. The D stands for a dominant driving personality. My wife is the epitome of the D personality to me. She's like, we're going over there. And she starts walking. If you don't go with her, it's your fault, you know. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Following her in the mall is a nightmare because she's just cruising, you know, and she goes into a store. Like, you got to be on your A game to keep up with, with Lori. She's just moving. The I personality is an influencer. It's an inspirer. These are people that uh, they, can, they get up and they're cheerleaders and they make you want to do something great, you know. Yeah, let's go. Wow. You know, it, that's, I'm an I personality. So I don't, that's just kind of, I don't know. It's how I'm made. This is it. S personality, these are the steady supportive folks. They sort of hide their emotions. They're just going to follow behind you and, and, and help you every step of the way. When the D personalities and the I personalities drop their keys in their phone because they're out looking for a party somewhere, you know, S's are the ones walking behind them picking their stuff up. Like, I'm going to help you get there in one piece, you know. And the C personality, these guys are calculated. These are correct. These are people that are going to help us get to where we are going and do it in the correct fashion. I want you to check this out. The D personality is a prophetic personality. Remember what Paul said? He's given some apostles and, and prophets. See, the, the prophet in, in the scriptures, they said, hey, believe me or not, I don't care. It's black and white. Deal with it, baby. This is what it says. That's the D personality. It's very prophetic. Just deal with it, bro. We're going that way. 
The I personality is the evangelist. These are the people that say, oh, Jesus is the best, bro. Don't you want to know Jesus? Oh, I love Jesus. You're crying, crying all the time. And you're like, yeah, I do want to know Jesus. I don't know anything about him, but I do because you're talking about him, you know? It's the evangelist personality. Don't you want some? Yeah, I want some, you know? The yes is the pastor. No, tell me about it. I'm, I'm listening. No, I, don't, I cleared the rest of my day. T tell me about it. Tell me what's going on. Yeah, yeah, I have nowhere to be. I'm just listening. That's the pastor. It's, it's, it's this S personality. It's, it, it's, it, anybody know a good listener, right? You're talking and talking, and you're like, don't you have somewhere to be? Don't worry about it. It's all about you right now. It's a beautiful thing. I love those people. They're awesome. I'm not in a rush. I'm listening to you, man. Then you have the C personality. It says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were almost right. This is the teacher that, you, that, that Paul was talking about. You were almost right. I pulled a report, uh, and here's all the data that I found. We need to fix these problems. You know, you have a teacher. Hey, that sounded great, but you need to go back and fix X, Y, Z. It's the teacher. It's what makes the body of Christ. It, it, it looks like in this personality test, like it has nothing to do with the, anything biblically, but it's exactly what he laid out in the five-fold ministry. Now, the apostle is the one that is mature in all these areas and knows how to cater and do what needs to be done in each of those situations. But we are all a mix of those four personalities because it's our divine enablement to do what God called us to do. Isn't it crazy to see something secular and something outside the church like this personality test just overlay into what Scripture is telling us? And this is not even talking about our spiritual gift that God gives us, what we talk about in our grow class. There's a stat that I heard recently. 87% of Christians don't know your spiritual gift, don't know our spiritual gift. What if 13% of your body knew what to do? The rest of it was just like trying to figure it out as it went along. You'd be a puddle of bone and, and skin, right? Your organs would be just like pumping blood different directions, and it'd be going all over the place. That's what the body of Christ looks like because we don't know what our divine enablement is. We don't want know what God's grace is for us. We have to figure it out. And why do we need to know that? For God's glory alone. Do people use God's giftedness for other purposes? Absolutely. God will use the grace on their life for selfish gain, for personal glory, to make more money, to, to influence relationships and how they want them to go. Some, like a child with a loaded gun, don't know what to do with the grace on their life, and they abuse it. But we need to make sure the grace that's on us is for one purpose, is for God's glory, his glory alone. The reason God gave us these gifts of grace, this divine enablement, is for his glory alone. And it, the anchor is us committing to keep us pointed in the right direction, and it's about him. It's all for him, not for ourselves. Let me show you the verse one more time. Christ gave himself apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for the works of service. He's given you that grace, and it shows up in different ways in your life. Some of you have a dominant personality. Stop apologizing for it. We need you to tell us where to go. He's given you, some of you guys, this inspirational thing about you that just, you, you, you have a crowd behind you because you're just like, yes, you're the best. I'm encouraging you. Let's find out more Jesus. Don't apologize for it. God needs you. We need you. Some of you guys are steady and, and stable, and, and you're like, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could get excited and, and tell people what's going on inside of me. Man, stop apologizing. Be who you are. You're the pastors of this people. We need you to care for us. And some of you guys are so analytical, you're sitting in the back and you're like, hey, I wish they could tweak that screen. It just hangs over a little bit on the side and it, it drives me insane. <laughs> Pastor Chris's green carpet is never actually in the middle of the stage. He's like, oh, God, this is. <sighs> I was going to say something smart, but we need you guys too. <laughs> you know? We do because we would fall apart, right? None of this would work. If you guys were able to see inside this room, my buddy Mike, he's my, my longest childhood friend. He's sitting back here and, and behind the board. Yeah, give it up for Mike. That's my man. He is a C personality all the way. If you, if you could see behind that door before a Sunday morning, he's got his ladder out and his soldering gun, and he's, like, fixing stuff in the ceiling. Like, I went out to test my mic. I'm like, hey, there's nothing's coming out. He's back there, like, rewiring all the power amps before. So we need guys like that, right? <laughs> or none of this would work. We'd be up here, hey, don't you think we should have sound? Does anybody know how to do this stuff? No, all the Cs, all the teachers, they all left because they thought we were crazy. We need each other, right? 
So he gave us all these things. He equipped his people, you and me and the person next to you and behind you, for works of service. Now here's the so that. This is, in Greek is called a henna clause. All the things that you read before it is for this very purpose. So that the body of Christ may be built up. So this body, this, the church you see right here, may be built up. This is like a crossfitter getting jacked. His body getting ripped and shredded. Just a terrible analogy, and I shouldn't flex whenever I say that. I'm sorry. But this is what happens when we work together, right? When everybody is moving in the right pace, everybody is pulling in the right direction, everybody's rowing in the right direction, all of us in a different way, our body, the body of Christ, this church, may be built up. This is what happens. We get stronger and quicker and more agile with more energy. People start to work together in unity regardless of how they look, how, where they come from, what they make, what they have done, who they are, what their name is. Man, when we work together, the body of Christ gets built up. All systems go, not bickering about trivial matters. Anybody ever been in a church that bickered about trivial matters? What color the carpet should be? Whether we should move the piano left or right? Whether the light should be this or this should be that? I mean, we've all been a part of an organization like that. No, that's it's not the body of Christ working together, being built up. It's when we push trivial matters aside and say, there are a lot of people in our city that are dying without knowing Jesus, and let's do whatever it takes, everything short of sin, so that they know God themselves. That's what we need to do. That's my main goal. I mean, I know some of that stuff's got to be worked out. we got to figure out those things, and we got to put attention to that stuff, and I'm fine with that. But I want the body of Christ to be built up so that this city has a church that's a lighthouse. So when someone hits rock bottom, they know where to go. All pistons firing together to accomplish the big mission, which is kingdom come. Heaven coming to earth through you, through me working together. When people look at us, they don't see us. They forget us. They see Christ through us. They see his compassion and his love for them. They see someone walking to a Christ that a cross that they didn't know, didn't know them, had nails pierced through their hands and died a vicious, violent death for them. They don't remember my name and your name. They don't know who the greeter was out there. All they remember is there was a Jesus that died for them and changed their life. That's what we need to be worried about. That's the big mission. That's what we're rowing toward. That's the glory we are pushing towards. That's the, the glory that we are, are driving towards with the grace that we have. It's the bullseye that we are pointing our grace and divine enablement toward. In Luther's day, there was a great separation between the secular, sac, sacred and the secular. Priests were elevated because they had a holy position. This is the elevation of pastors and, and, and priests and, and people who work at a church. Like they had a holy occupation, but uh, uh, shoemakers and tailors, they were thought to have a simple, meaningless job, an unimportant job. But Luther, in the 1500s, he said, no, 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 no. He believed that God saved and gave grace for us for, to give glory to God in everything that we do. Whether you're a machinist or a construction worker or a carpenter or a banker or a stay-at-home mom, whatever we do, we can give glory to God in, in all of it. Luther believed the tailor, the farmer, the mother, the stay-at-home mom could all give God glory. There was no separation between vocation and spirituality. It's not what you're doing that determines your spiritual. It's how you are doing it that determines if you do it in a spiritual manner. He said this, he said, the prince should think, Christ has served me and made everything uh, to follow him. Therefore, I should also serve my neighbor, protect him and everything that belongs to him. That's why God has given me this office, and I have it so that I might serve him. That would be a good prince and a ruler, Luther said. When a prince sees his neighbor oppressed, he should think, that concerns me. I must protect and shield my neighbor. He continued and said, the same is true for the shoemaker, the tailor, the scribe, or the reader. If he has a Christian tailor, he, he would say, I make these clothes because God has bidden me to do so, so that I can earn a living, so that I can help and serve my neighbor. When a Christian does not serve the other, God is not present. That is not Christian living. I don't care what you do for a living. Do it for God's glory. I don't care if your boss is a jerk. Everything you do, he comes back and points out what you did wrong. There are people who are just wired that way. I don't care who he is or who she is or how they operate. Do it for God's glory. 
Do it like Christ was your boss. Jesus himself was a carpenter, your boss. He's coming back to check your work. Do it for God's glory. Not just so that you would get his approval, so that when people would see it, they would point to God and say, man, isn't God good? That there are people that can build houses, and it's not going to fall over when there's a hurricane. And come. Isn't God good? That he gave people the, the, the vision to do something great. Those deep personalities, that prophetic personality that can see something out of nothing. Isn't God good that he gave them that personality? They can see something that I never could see. You ever go see something amazing, a big building, a statue, and just look at it and say, man, someone had this vision. It came out of nothing. Isn't God good? You see someone inspiring that can stand on a stage and, 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 and encourage you and pull something out of you, pull potential out of you, and you say, man, isn't God good? He, he, he made people like that to help me see myself better than I am. Isn't God good? Someone comes alongside of you and cares for you. They send you that text message at just the right time. When you feel like everything's falling apart, they send you a message and say, hey, man, love you. Everything's going to work out. I don't know what you're going through. It's going to be okay. You say, man, isn't God good? He made someone like that. Someone to think about me when they have all their stuff going on. And those accurate people come alongside and say, man, if you just tweaked it this way, if you just moved it from here to there, changed a degree or two, you could fix it. And you could say, man, isn't God good? Because they did it for God's glory, not for selfish gain. When a Christian doesn't serve the other, God is not present. It's not Christian living. So there are far too many things in this life coming at us, fads and advertising and gadgets and our own wants and desires and prides and lust. We are in serious need of an anchor, something to keep us steady. How do we stay anchored in him? We think this is a good place to begin. Receive salvation through faith alone. There's nothing you can do to earn God's favor, his forgiveness. You just receive it by faith. Stop working for it. He's already forgiven you. Just say yes. Second thing we do is we stand on God's word and his word alone. Sermons are great. Commentary is great. Podcasts are great. Books and conferences and Gary V and the Pope and that cool Instagram post guy that you follow and, and your friend who's kind of poetic, you know, and, and, and your own grandiose thoughts. and All these things are good things, but the only thing worth building our lives upon like a foundation is his word and his word alone. That's our second anchor. It's him. And his word points to one person, Jesus. Salvation isn't found in Peter, James, and John, and Martin Luther, and Billy Graham, and Stephen Furtick, and Hillsong United's latest album, and T.D. Jakes, and John Piper, or Chris Lockamy. And that's probably the first and last time all those names will be in the same sentence together. <laughs> but I have the microphone, and it's just, I'll, I'll list them together. These are all great men. God. <laughs> It's Christ and Christ alone. That, that, that's the anchor that we need to find. It, 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 that's where we anchor our life. He is the anchor of anchors. You want to anchor your life? Find out how God has gifted you, what his grace is on your life. It's going to look different than your neighbor. But find out what it is, what you are here for, what your purpose is. Not sure of your purpose? Well, form speaks to function. In my, my kitchen drawer, I have a gadget drawer. I have spatulas in there, and I have tongs in there, and I've got like a, a, an egg scrambler, you know, that like a, it's a whisk, right? Right? Yeah, you guys are laughing. I'm like, bad analogy. That's, uh... So if I went to like make an omelet with a whisk, I, I would just be making more of a mess, right? And it's good for scrambling the eggs, but it's not good for flipping the eggs, you know? You have a particular form, and it speaks to your function. You were created a specific way, and it speaks to what God wants to do with you and through you. See, some of us are whisks trying to flip eggs, and some of us are spatulas trying to stir eggs. It would work, but it's going to make a mess. Find out who you are, how God has formed you, what His grace is on your life, and it will speak to your purpose. Know your form. Your function will become that much more clear. God's grace is not just more mercy and more forgiveness. It's a divine enablement for a purpose to give God glory in all that you do. Find out what it is. Today just so happens to be the purpose class. 
Sounds like we set it up, right? And guess who's one of your teachers today? Oh, yeah. It's me. You're going to be so purposed in about an hour, you're not going to know what to do with yourself. I'll leave you this challenge as we wrap up. You want to get unstuck? You want to get moving? You want to break the chain of that habitual sin in your life? There may be some confession that needs to happen. There may be some deep work that really needs to happen. I encourage you to do that. But one of your options also may be to figure out how you are wired and get moving in it. I make 90% of the mistakes in my life, not when I'm trying hard, but when I have idle time because I drift from where I'm supposed to be. My attention is, is just so short. We are far too easily pleased. Want to get unstuck? Find out your purpose, how he's created you, what he's created you for. The purpose will start to take shape. You can start to give God's glory in your own unique way for the reason the grace he's given you. Another quote I'll leave you with. Many of us attribute it to Luther, but we, we can't find out who actually said it, but it, it, it kind of speaks to his heart on the matter. He says, the maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she may be singing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does not, it doesn't do his Christian duty uh, by putting little crosses on his shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Do what God has designed for you to do and do it for his glory and it will keep your life anchored. I would dare say that you wouldn't achieve God's fullness for you, for your life and us as a church, as a body, without each other. Us doing it together. As long as you call this your church, you won't reach your full God-given potential without the person sitting next to you without all of us working in God's grace, his divine enablement. So let's get to living in grace and grace alone and for one purpose, for his glory. Let's pray this morning. If you could bow your heads, close your eyes as we wrap up today. God, we need you. We need your grace. The task before us is too hard. It's too big. Just resisting my own sin and trying to live a, a Christian life is too hard. God, I need your empowerment. I need something greater than myself. Cover us, God. Protect us, Lord. Empower us to understand what we need. Help us to keep your word as an anchor. Your grace, your glory as an anchor. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe this morning for you, it isn't discovering God's gift for you, but maybe it's just beginning a relationship with him today. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you'd love to know all of that stuff, but this is your first step this morning is to know him maybe for the first time. He's been calling you to know him. He's been inviting you into a relationship with him. And today's the day. Don't let this moment pass without knowing him. He's calling you to accept his forgiveness, not by working for it, but simply believing. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's the way that he designed it. Today, he's inviting you to come to life. He's inviting you to a fresh start. So this morning, we're gonna pray in just a moment. Everyone in the room, we're gonna say the same prayer. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you want one, on the count of three, before we pray, I'm just gonna ask you to slip your hand up in the air. Just a sign between you and God. Just saying, count me in, Lord. I want a relationship with you. I need you. Hands already going up. One, know that he accepts you just as you are. Two, he loves you more than you know. Three, would you lift your hand up and say, I want a relationship with Jesus. You're just saying yes to God. Thank you for that hand. Awesome. One, two, three. Man, awesome. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Man, all across the room. Praise God. Awesome. Awesome. So would you join me across the room, front to back, side to side? Would you repeat this after me? Would you say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to give you room in my heart. Thank you for a new beginning in you. Thank you for your grace 
I confess I can't do this on my own. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and make me new today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate with those people who made a commitment this morning? Yeah. Right. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for that inspiring message. Um, let's take a hold of that grace that God gives us, that undeserved grace, and go change the world this week, uh, living in the body of Christ and doing what we're meant to do. Um, two quick things. Uh, if it's your first time, we want to thank you for being here. If you accepted Christ as your Savior today, we want to talk to you. Um, I'll be out of the next steps table uh, in just a second. Uh, also, we want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, for regular attenders, we have our joy boxes for our paper offerings. Then we also want to encourage you, if, if, if you wanted to, to give online or text to give. Thank you, guys. Love you. Have a great week.